Wow. It was loud in this house, as it should be. Right? Amen. Amen. If we don't get excited to worship the Lord, then what in the world is there to get excited about on Good Friday? But I want to take it back a little bit, just, just to wrap up this week that we're in, in the final week of our Lord's life and ministry on earth, the Passion Week, which means the week of suffering. And it began on Sunday, last Sunday, 2,000 years ago, with Jesus' final trip to Jerusalem. And on that Sunday, if you harmonize the gospel stories together, you can see and put the pieces of the puzzle of what happened during Jesus' final week on earth, and they certainly include the high points. And on that Sunday, he rode into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, actually the less than triumphal entry, because he came in not as a conquering, militant Messiah and king. He came in on a donkey's colt. And he did it in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy concerning Messiah, which said he would come in riding on a donkey's colt in Zechariah 9.9, and he did. And on Monday, he went to the temple, the center of religion in Israel, the most holy place. And he was filled with righteous indignation, righteous anger at all the corruption, at all the commerce that was going on in the temple, which he said is my father's house of prayer and of worship. And you've turned it into a den of robbers. And he knocks over the animal merchant tables and the money changers, and he cracks them all out of there with a whip. He says, this is my father's house, and it's meant to be a place of worship and of prayer. How dare you? And the religious leaders are standing by. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back over the course of three and a half years when they were plotting and trying to catch him at every turn and seize the right opportunity to arrest him and to try him and to sentence him to death. Until then, Jesus had evaded them because it was his divine schedule. He wasn't ready to go out until this final moment. And so the plot thickens. And they say, he needs to die. And so what happens on that Wednesday? Judas, one of the 12, he meets with the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, right, the ruling council of Israel in Jerusalem, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and he sells him. He says, I'll tell you where he'll be, where you can seize him under cover of night and outside of the city walls, away from the, the crowds that bustle all around him as an insulative layer to protect him. I'll tell you where he's going to be. And he did so for a measly 30 pieces of silver. Again, in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy concerning Messiah from Zechariah 11:13. And then on Thursday, Jesus has his final meal on earth, the Last Supper, which is a Passover meal, which he then transforms into the Lord's Supper as he inaugurates a new covenant, right? He says, this bread represents my body, my being with you, my abiding presence with you forever. And he breaks it and he gives it to the disciples. And then he takes the cup and he says, this, this cup, this wine represents my blood of the new covenant by which you are saved. And by blood he means life because he knew he would soon pour out his life unto death on that cross. Typically, the Passover meal was supposed to be a joyous occasion. Not so with this meal. It quickly takes a turn for the darkest because Jesus makes a prediction as they're eating and smiling and laughing and joking. He says, one of you is going to betray me. And one by one, they deny, not I, not I, not I, not I. The meal ends. They start walking on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane because Jesus needs to spend some time in prayer seeking strength from the Father and from the Spirit because he knows his hour has almost come. And on the journey to Gethsemane, he makes another prediction. He says, I tell you, in the hour of my greatest need, when I need you the most, my friends, my companions, you're all going to forsake me and abandon me. And again, they all deny, not I, not I. 
Peter, the leader of the twelve, and the most brazen with the bravado. He says, even if they all do, surely not me. I will never. And what does Jesus say? I tell you truly, truly, Peter, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times this night. And they get to the garden. And they're in the garden, and Jesus says to the nine, wait here. And he takes James and John and Peter with him a little deeper. And he says, you come with me. I need to pray. And Jesus goes in farther. And he's so distraught. He's so anxious. He knows the cup that's before him that he must drink the bitter wrath of God. And in his humanity, not his divinity, because he was both God and he was man, but in his divinity... He falls prostrate on the ground, and he begins to pray to the Father so intensely that he actually begins to sweat blood, Luke says. He starts to sweat blood. It's a real but very rare medical condition, hematidrosis. He's sweating blood. And for a moment in his flesh, he contemplates if this cup might pass. But then he snaps out of it in his divinity, and he's resolute to accomplish the mission for which he came, the redemption of all of humanity. And he says, not my will, but yours. And he gets up, and he goes back to Peter, James, and John, and the others, and he finds them sleeping three times because it says their eyes were slow and they were sleepy and they were exhausted from a long and heavy Passover meal. And then Judas arrives. Judas and his band of temple guards with the religious leaders and torches by night. And he comes to Jesus and he says, this is the sign so you'll know who it is, the one whom I kiss. And he kisses Jesus with the kiss of betrayal, his friend, the one whom He broke bread with, the one whom he prayed with, lived with, slept with, walked with for three and a half years. As he approaches him and kisses him on the cheek, he simultaneously places a dagger in his back. And so the guard sees him. And Jesus' prediction in his omniscience, he knows everything. It's exactly what happens. The disciples quickly fall away. They're scared for their lives, so they all beeline it out of there. And they bring him to the high priest's house, the ruling council of Israel. Peter, a little braver than the rest, he follows off at a distance. And so they start this kangaroo court now in the high priest's house, bringing up all sorts of false charges against Jesus. And none of them stick. They bring in false testimony. All of these witnesses' testimonies keeps on contradicting themselves. It's not working. So finally, the high priest stands up and he says, Do you claim to be the Son of God? And Jesus says, truly, truly, I tell you, you will see me at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. And at that, the high priest rips his garment. That's what they did when there was blasphemy, when it was something so egregious, so outrageous. He rips his garment and he says, we have heard enough. He deserves to die. And they all begin to chant and scream. And then they seize him, and they begin to punch him, it says, and to kick him, and to taunt him after they put a blindfold around him. Prophesy now, who hit you now? Punch after punch, kick after kick, spitting in the face of God. But they know they don't have the authority to execute him. They're a vassal state to the Romans, so they bring him to the Roman governor, Pilate, the governor of Judea. And they know they need to position this very carefully. It's got to be enough of an offense to be worthy of capital punishment under Roman law. And so what do they say? They say sedition. He's claiming to be a king. And there could be no king but Caesar. And so if this is sedition, he deserves to die. And Pilate, after interrogating him one to one, you see this most deeply in the Gospel of John in chapters 18 and 19, he realizes that Jesus is innocent. He's an innocent man. He doesn't deserve to die. He wants to release him. And the religious leaders start to sense that, so they sway the crowds, and the crowds are so fickle, the ones who just a few days earlier were welcoming in with shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, to the one who comes in the name of the Lord, now they're turning against him. 
They start chanting for him to be crucified. And Pilate says, shall I crucify an innocent man, your king? He said, we have no king but Caesar. Pilate doesn't want to do it. He washes his hands symbolically, free from his blood in a basin of water. And what do the religious leaders in the crowds chant? That's fine. His blood is on our hands and on our children. On our children. That's how badly they wanted Jesus dead. And so Pilate, he's torn. His wife has had a dream the night before. She said, don't do it. But he's thinking about his career and his job. There have been a lot of riots, zealot uprising, and he can't afford another report going back to the emperor because if it does, he'll certainly be recalled this time. So he relents. He releases another Jesus, Barabbas actually, an insurrectionist, a rebel, a murderer. They would rather have him than the right and innocent Jesus. And so he hands him over to be crucified to his, sh- uh, to his soldiers. But before he's to be crucified, he's to be intensely scourged. And so soldiers seize Jesus. They they tie his hands together above his head to a wooden plank. And two burly, well-trained, murderous Roman soldiers stand on either side of him with long whips of leather and with little metal and sharp rocks and glass tied to individual leather cords at the end of these whips. And they begin to scourge Jesus mercilessly. Whip after whip on his back, on his front, on his legs, wherever they could hit. Scourging him so intensely that you start to see wounds open up, lacerations all over his body, anywhere between 12 to 14 inches long and an inch and a half deep. Until his back looks unrecognizable anymore as a mangled mess of blood and of tissue and of bone. Not unlike Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, a very accurate depiction of just what Jesus endured in that scourging. And so they scourge him half to death. And it's interesting. You read the accounts, as we read earlier in Isaiah, if you turn to Isaiah 52, 14. How badly was Jesus scourged? Listen to Isaiah 52, 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, he didn't even look human anymore. In 53, verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. They couldn't even look at him. They had to hide their faces. And they continue to mock and to taunt him. You flip back a few pages, listen to another messianic prophecy from Isaiah. In chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and from spitting. And when they've had enough of their scourging, The mockery's not over. They untie him now as he's laying there, bleeding half to death. And the guards prop him up. And they prop him up. And they fashion together a crown, which is to be like a laurel wreath that they would put on victorious athletes or conquering militant generals. But instead, they fashion this one out of thorns. Thorns, half inch to an inch long. They place it on his head and they press them in with their thumbs to make sure they go right into all the veins and all the cartilage. The scalp is one of the most vascular parts of the body. He was bleeding profusely. On top of already bleeding profusely from that intense scourging. Then they take a a reed, a staff, they put it in his hand, his right hand, to be like a scepter. A scepter. And they they throw a a purple robe on him. 
And they start to bow down in, in mockery and homage. Hail, king of the Jews. Like they would hail a conquering, mighty, militant general coming into Rome. They'd have these processions, these real triumphal entries. And they're mocking him. And then they take the staff out of the king's hand, and they start to beat him in the head with it, Matthew says. They take the king's staff and beat him in the head and the face with it. Until he's unrecognizable, as Isaiah says. And when they finally had their fill of mocking, when the fun was finally over, they rip off that purple robe, he says. They they rip it off his back, which at that point, after being on him for who knows how long, 30 minutes, an hour, all the open and shredded back was probably sealed shut to all the blood and the serum. And so it would have been callously ripped off and painful, like ripping off a bandage too early from a deep and intense wound. And then they take him, and they place the crossbeam of the cross on him, the patibulum, which would have been anywhere between 80 to 110 pounds. And they tie it to his back. And now they lead him, they force him to carry his cross all the way from Pilate's headquarters to Calvary, down what's come to be known as the Via Dolorosa in Latin, the the way of suffering, 650 yards But his wounds are getting the better of him. And somewhere along the way, he falls down and he can't carry his cross anymore. And so the soldiers see this. They randomly pick a guy out of the crowds who looks strong enough, Simon of Cyrene. And he picks up his cross for him. And then they make it all the way back to Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And when they get there, they lay Jesus on his back. And a Roman soldier stretches out one arm on the crossbeam. And another Roman soldier takes a seven-inch spike and he cocks the hammer back and he starts nailing Jesus to the cross. And then they do the same to the other hand. And then they take his feet, placing them one over another, and they take an even bigger spike, which would be required to go through double the set of bone and tissue, and they drive it straight through his ankles and his feet to the cross. And now he's hanging there. It's 9 a.m. For six hours, struggling to breathe as his, the entire weight of his body is hanging on those nails. His lungs are collapsing. He's beginning to suffocate, actually. His fisciation is kicking in. And so he tries to push himself up by his feet, which are driven into the cross by nails, intensely increasing the pain just to get a grasp and a small breath of air so he can continue to stay alive. And if you follow the chronology on the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know that a lot of things took place during those six hours. And if we could piece it together with any degree of accuracy, and we can, it says they crucified him at nine, nine in the morning. And as he's hanging there, perhaps at ten, he prays, Father, forgive them. More time goes by. The soldiers divide up Jesus' clothes again in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The crowds, the people around begin to hurl insults at him, mocking him, wagging their heads, abusing him. Ha, huh, if you're the son of God, why don't you come down right now and prove it? The religious leaders, the people get in on the action. Even the robbers on either side of him begin to mock him. Jesus looks down at his mother, and instead of calling her mother, he says, woman, behold your son to the apostle John, son, behold your mother. And from then on in, he cares for her, knowing Jesus, his life will be over, and she needs to be taken care of. And at noon, it says, darkness covered the whole land for three hours, midday. From clear blue skies to pitch black darkness for three hours. A terrifying sight. Jesus cries out 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't even address him as father anymore. He used to call him father. Why doesn't he address him as father anymore? Because for the first time in his eternal existence as God and the Son of God, he experiences the Father's face turning away from him as he carries the weight of our sin on the cross. Because God is so separate from sin, he can't stand to be in the presence of sin. He can't stand to look at sin. And he turns his face from his only begotten Son. And Jesus, for the first time, feels what it's like to be abandoned by the Father. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he says, I thirst. And they give him a sponge with sour wine and hyssop. And after he, he tastes it, in John 19, 30, he says, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathes his last. And he gives up his life. And an earthquake hits. At that moment when he breathed his last, and the the temple curtain is torn in two that would mark out the most holy place where only the high priest could go in once a year into the presence of God, symbolically, God from heaven tears down that veil because he knows now it's not the whole the high priest that has access to God once a year. No, everybody will have access to God. It's the eternal priesthood of believers through faith in Jesus Christ. And Matthew says the tombs break open, and the dead are raised to life running around the countryside. Incredible displays of supernatural activity and miracles, just proving and vindicating all the more that Jesus truly was the Son of God. Even the Roman soldier, the centurion, was there at the foot of the cross when he saw the manner in which Jesus died, meaning he gave up his own life, he went out on his own terms, he was on a divine schedule, they didn't kill him. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. The soldiers break the legs, the knees of the two robbers on either side. But they don't break Jesus' legs because that's to fulfill Old Testament scripture concerning the way Messiah would die. Not a bone in his body would be broken. So they don't touch him. But just to make sure they're dead, they take a spear and they thrust it into his side. And it says water and blood, a mixture of both, just, just spills out to make sure he's dead. And they take him down from the cross. And they bury him. And when I think about what happened on that cross, and specifically the words that Jesus said in his cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That should have been me crying that out on the cross. That should have been you crying that out on the cross. But because Jesus was forsaken by God the Father, you and I can be forgiven by God the Father. Because in that moment, Jesus experienced the abandonment of God the Father. We can experience the adoption of God the Father as sons of God and daughters of God into the family of God. And I also think about the fact that Jesus, despite the brutal method in which he was executed, despite the physical suffering that he endured beyond anyone in human history, he was not a victim. Did you know that? He was not a victim, he's a victor over sin, Satan, and death. And we see that because Sunday's a coming, but he was not a victim. Why was he not a victim? He was not a victim because he laid down his life willingly. He laid down his life willingly. He did it according to the predetermined and predestined plan of God. Have you read what Peter says in that great first sermon in church history in Acts 2, after the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes and empowers and fills and energizes the apostles to do that which Christ commissioned them to do, proclaim the gospel and make disciples. And he comes down and Peter stands up in Acts 2, 22. He says this, 
Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the what? The definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. That's the Romans. This was according to the plan of God. God was in charge of this. And Jesus came down willingly. And again, if you turn back to that passage in Isaiah 53, you heard what Anthony was reading earlier in verse 10. It says, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. No, this was God's plan all along. Jesus willingly laid down his life. In John 10, 11, what does he say? I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And a few verses later in 17, 18, he says, no one takes my life from me. Are you crazy? I lay my life down willingly. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up. He did it willingly. Willingly. And not only that, what exactly did he do? What happened on that cross? What transaction took place? You go back to Isaiah 53, and he gives us some hints, doesn't he? Listen to verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every single one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Look at the... End of verse 11. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be counted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. End of verse 12. And yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Do you get the point here? This is the language of substitution. This is the language of sacrifice. We call it substitutionary sacrifice, where there is a substitute in the place of someone to make atonement. And this is the clear teaching throughout Scripture, including in the New Testament, where Paul says in Romans 5, 8, and this is love of God, that Christ died for us, for us. God demonstrates his love that Christ died for us. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he puts it this way. He says, in this is love, that God loved us so much that he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, which means he had no sin in him, to be sin, which means to bear sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. There was an exchange that happened on the cross. Jesus takes our sin and our guilt and the penalty and punishment for sin, and he gives us his perfect righteousness because he did live the life according to God's law, perfectly without sin. He was the sinless, spotless, blemishlessness lamb of God. Even in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system, it was always that way. Because of sin, something or someone had to die. Death entered the world through sin. And God instituted the sacrificial system, didn't he, with the temple offerings. And you see that all throughout Israel. And you read Leviticus and Deuteronomy and in Numbers. They had to keep offering up these sacrifices time after time after time. And on that day of atonement in Leviticus 16, you even see this symbolized as far as the transferring of guilt, this, this substituting of guilt as the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies and he places his hand on the goat, the scapegoat, and he metaphorically, he symbolically transfers his own sin in all the people of Israel on this goat, and then that goat is cut off from the people, abandoned, separated, forsaken, sent out to live in the wilderness forever, symbolizing the carrying away of sin. And that was Jesus, our scapegoat. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, our Passover lamb, who was a better sacrifice, because 
In the Old Testament, they had to keep offering sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats and rams and lambs could only do so much. They had to continually be offered up by the priests and by the high priest all the time. And they were pointing forward to the need to a greater sacrifice. And that's the Son of God because he was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And that's what the writer of Hebrews says. Those Old Testament sacrifices were nothing. Jesus is the better and ultimate and final sacrifice. Take hold of him, he says. He's a substitute. A substitute for sinners. But Jesus on that cross, he didn't pay the penalty for everyone's sin. So I'm going to go, <gasps> Right? Otherwise, why are there people dying in hell and going to hell now? Right? You can't have a double payment. If he paid their sins, they wouldn't be in hell. Right? That's normal. That's reasonable. That's rational. No, in order to have your sins forgiven, you need to believe. Right? You need to believe. You need to come to him. In his words, if you use him at his words and take him at his words, in John 10, he says, I lay my life down for my sheep. Do you see that qualification? He didn't say, I lay my life down for the goats. He said, for my sheep, I lay it down. Which means you have to believe. How do I become a sheep? Believe. Come to the cross this Good Friday, if you haven't already, and forsake your sin. Admit that you're a sinner and confess that Jesus alone is Savior and that in his body and in his death, he took the wrath of God, fully satisfying it, and on the third day rose victoriously, proving that God accepted his sacrifice in your place as that substitute, and you'll be saved, he says. It's that simple. It's that simple. And you'll be that sheep that he laid his life down to rescue. Forsake yourself. If anyone thinks they have something to offer to contribute to their salvation, to their forgiveness, to their redemption, then you've missed the point. You've missed the gospel. The glorious gospel of grace in which God, in his infinite wisdom and purposes, is glorified to put his mighty redemption on display by doing it all. As we sang earlier, Jesus paid it all. Who wouldn't want to believe in a Savior like that? And that's who we worship this Good Friday. That's who we celebrate this Good Friday. That's who we follow every single day of our lives. This Jesus who would do this for us. And so despite the darkness and the evil from, from the human perspective, for, for those who did this to Jesus, as we've been reflecting and, and contemplating this evening, from the divine perspective, he did this for us willingly. And because of this lavish, because of this gracious, because of his humiliation and his suffering in our place, that's why we call it Good Friday. It was a good Friday for us. The goat Friday. The greatest of all time Friday because of the Lamb and Son of God. But it wouldn't have been if he stayed in the grave. But Sundays are coming. As the worship team prepares to lead us in a couple songs of worship, as we come to the Lord's table and the ushers prepare to serve the elements, I invite you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father.